Hi everybody, I'm delighted uh, to welcome you to the first episode of 2022 of the ESDR Kitchen. Um, I'm Midel O'Toole, I'm an academic uh, in London. Um, basically the ESDR Kitchen was uh, set up during the pandemic to uh, bring updates uh, on skin science to the ESDR members and also to the skin community. Uh, today we've got um, a freshly baked uh, session um, where uh, two high impact research papers uh, will be uh, presented. Um, you can ask your questions and answers while the questions certainly in the Q&A and are in the chat and we will go, go to the questions at the end. Um, so today we've got Johannes Mayer from uh, and Maximilian Kukovas, um, and we're delighted that they could present their papers uh, to us today. And I'll pass you on to Curtin Conrad, who will introduce the first speaker. Thanks, Adele. So it's a pleasure to introduce Johannes Mayer, who did his uh, Bachelor of Science in the, at the Technical University in Munich, then his uh, PhD in Glasgow, UK. He traveled actually quite a bit over, all over the world. Finally, he uh, arrived at, uh, in Wellington, New Zealand, where he did this uh, excellent work he's going to present now to us in the lab of Franco Roncese. He's now back actually in, uh, on the bright side or the good side of uh, research, came back to dermatology, and he's now um, leading his own research group in the Department of Dermatology in Marburg, back in Germany. And he's going to present us his uh, most recent work that was published in Nature Immunology. So uh, thanks a lot for having you, oh, for coming, and uh, the stage is yours, Johannes. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to pre present our work to you today. Um, since the discovery of dendritic cells in the skin in the 1970s, immunologists have appreciated the phenotypic, ontogenetic and functional differences of antigen presenting cells that are present in all tissues. And over time, we have realized that some cells either constantly arrive from the bone marrow and uh, enter, the, enter all tissues through the bloodstream or are seeded during embryonic development and are locally maintained as for example, for resident macrophages and Langerhans cells. While we now know a lot about these different populations, which include, for example, functionally different subsets of dendritic cells, such as plasmocytoid dendritic cells, type 1 dendritic cells, or type 2 dendritic cells, or belong to the monocyte or macrophage lineage, more recent observations have shown that type 2 dendritic cells, which are present in all tissues, have a particular tissue-specific expression patterns of southern surface markers and also transcripts, and in different contexts can lead to the differentiation of C different CD4 T cell uh, populations. And so two hypotheses have developed in the field that might explain this heterogeneity, which seems to be tissue-specific. And the first hypothesis argue that these uh, homogeneous or cluster of dendritic cells, type of dendritic cells, has received signals from the external environment, either signals from the tissue or signals from different antigens, which have then led to the specific expression of transcripts or uh, surface proteins, and then also can be associated with a unique function. While the second hypothesis argue that actually um, with uh, previous technologies, we were only able to detect a homogeneous population, but that within this homo homogeneous group, there's actually heterogeneity that we now need to identify, and that actually um, subsets of these types of dendritic cells are responsible to process and present specific antigens, have a unique functionality and drive unique responses. And so now the question is, can we use novel technologies on a single cell level that will allow us to define and which of these hypotheses can be supported with novel data? And so this uh, project was part of my postdoctoral work at the Malagan Institute in New Zealand. And we used high dimensional flow cytometry to, to identify different populations and different types of dendritic cells from uh, 
pool data sets, which uh, we derive from steady state mice and different tissue draining lymph nodes. And what we observed was that there was a clear segregation between the different known types of dendritic cells, the type two dendritic cells, type one dendritic cells and Langerhans cells. But that within this cluster of type two dendritic cells, the, um, um, the clustering and populations of these cells were segregating by tissue. And so we wanted to understand what tissue defining markers were unique and were leading to this specific clustering. And we could identify that in the skin, there was a unique segregation based on the surface expression of CD11B. And then in the skin, there were two subsets of uh, CD11B populations, the CD11B high DC2 and the CD11B low DC2. Whereas in the steady state lung, there were CD24 positive uh, dendritic cells that were unique and CD24 negative type two dendritic cells. And in the intestine, there was the presence of CD103 positive type two dendritic cells and also CD103 negative type two dendritic cells. And so to identify if there was also, um, if this uh, was also true in the draining lymph nodes, as well as the originating tissues. We looked at the steady state at C57 black six mice, and we could observe that these tissues were present at equal proportions in the tissue, as well as the draining lymph nodes, suggesting that this is a highly conserved development, which we always also found in male and female mice and also mice of different genotypes. And so we wondered if this steady state um, appearance of type two uh, of tissue specific type two dendritic cells was also associated with a unique transcriptomic phenotype. And so we sorted these six different populations and performed bulk RNA sequencing, which you can see here. And what we observed that the six populations we sorted um, segregated into four um, unique clusters or similar clusters that express similar transcript transcriptomic patterns. And what really stood out that the CD103 positive type two dendritic cells from the intestine, as well as the CD11 below type two dendritic cells from the skin really expressed a very unique transcriptomic signature. So we were quite intrigued by this observation and we asked if some of these transcripts that were to, unique to either of these populations also had um, common uh, transcriptional and upstream regulators. And so we assess the enrichment for transcription factor binding sites. And what we uh, observed here, and this is represented in an upset plot, which is basically a different representation for a um, multidimensional Venn diagram. What we can observe here is that um, transcription factor enrichment was particularly unique to this cluster 3B, which are the CD11 below DC2s, and that these unique transcription factors that seem to regulate these, um, uh, the unique transcripts within this population were regulated by a number of uh, key transcription factors, which in the literature have been, some of those have been associated with uh, T cell interaction and antigen uptake. But interestingly, we also observed uh, um, a strong uh, transcription enrichment or um, binding site enrichment for STAT-6, which was very surprising to us because STAT-6 is well-defined in type two immunity and is important for R4 and R13 signaling, but has so far not been described to play a role in dendritic cells, especially at the steady state. And so we wanted to understand if this unique um, enrichment of STAT-6 transcripts was somehow related to a functional or developmental um, scenario in, in this unique population of dendritic cells. And so we looked at STAT-6 knockout mice at the steady state and what we, so, uh, what we observed was extremely striking because the observation was that in, this, um, um, in the STAT-6 knockout mice at the steady state, the CD11 below DC2 population was not present whereas CD11 be high um, could, be could be detected normally, as well as all other populations in the lung or the, uh, or the intestine, suggesting that either R4 or R13 signaling plays a crucial role in the skin at the steady state and leads to the development of this population. 
To confirm that this was really the case, we performed in addition single cell RNA sequencing and again focused on the type 2 dendritic cells in the skin, either in C57 or STAT6 knockout mice. And we observed that again, that uh, in an unbiased fashion in a, a single cell RNA sequencing approach, we um, populations or cells that were related to the CD11 below DC2 population were not present in the STAT6 knockout mice. So having identified that STAT6 is crucial for the development of this population of dendritic cells in the skin, we then wanted to ask if this development was, uh, was guided by the type two cytokines that have been associated with STAT6 activation, which are R4 and R13. And we again looked at um, the DC2 in the draining lymph, skin draining lymph nodes at the steady state in either R4 knockout or R13 knockout mice. And we observed that R4 did not uh, play a role in STAT6 activation and CD11 below DC2 development at the steady state, whereas in R13 knockout mice, there was um, a strong reduction in the development of this CD11 below DC2 population, which was very similar to the observations in STAT6 knockout mice, indicating that STAT6 is necessary for the activation of STAT6, of STAT6 in these cells and for the development of this population. Now we wondered, um, because in the literature there have been very few reports that R13 is homeostatically present in naive skin, we wondered which population was producing R13 at, at homeostatic levels. And we used again high dimensional flow cytometry in R13 reporter mice to define which cell population was um, reporter positive for R13 trans or expression. And we observed that at the steady state, RLCs in the skin were the predominant cell population that uh, produced R13 and that uh, skin RLCs were producing R13 at the steady state, whereas lung RLCs or intestinal RLCs did not. And what was also interesting, but in the interest of time, I will just briefly mention, was that these RLCs looked to have a resting phenotype, which was leading to the production of R13, but they were not uh, expressing the common markers for RLC2s, which for example, were expressed very strongly by lung RLCs, which had a clear RLC2 phenotype, but did not express R13 at the steady state. To now understand what the development of this particular population of uh, dermal dendritic cells um, means for a functional uh, functional immune responses, especially in uh, for the differentiation of different T cells, we used two in vivo models, which were a mixed bone marrow chimera or also an R4 receptor alpha flux ZTC uh, CRE um, conditional knockout mice, which both had the phenotype that in the, that there were control animals, but also a test group where in this test group, CD11 below DC2s in the skin were not um, present, while T cell responses were not in, affected in either of these systems. And so we now assess the requirement of this population to drive different T cell responses and assess changes if we either immunized um, these mice with um, type one inducing antigens, for example, mycobacterium. In this case, we saw that the absence of CD11 below DC2s did not lead to a change in the um, inferon gamma production and the development of Th1 cells. However, when we use type two inducing antigens, for example, Nipostrongylus plasduiensis, we observed that in the absence of this cell, uh, of this dendritic cell, Please. There was a, a strong reduction of Th2 responses, whereas there was an increase in Th17 um, when we immunized with Candida, which we observed in both models. Lastly, we also observed that this R13 signaling was also 
present in human skin uh, DC2s from healthy individuals, suggesting that the phenotype was not only mouse specific, but is also relevant to humans, and suggest that this particular population of CD11 below DC2s, which is driven through R13 and STAT6 driven differentiation, plays a crucial role in the balance of TH17 and TH2 responses at the steady state in naive skin. And so with that, I want to uh, just thank the um, um, people who have contributed, especially Frank Caroncese and Olivier Lamable, as well as everybody uh, from the lab and our collaborators and funding agencies. And thank you for listening. Uh, thanks, Johannes. Uh, very pleased to introduce the next speaker. Um, Maximilian uh, Kukelhaus, who's uh, Assistant Professor of Plastic Surgery and Head of Experimental uh, Plastic Surgery at the Department of Plastic Surgery in uh, Munster. He has a long history of uh, working on um, wound healing uh, and, and grafting and has been very involved in this remarkable work where uh, a nature paper was published on reconstitution of epidermis in JEB. Uh, and th this is a follow-up paper, which uh, he published in the New England Journal of Medicine in December. So thanks, Maximilian. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, for the invitation and the, the opportunity to present our work. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, mainly the long-term outcomes of this treatment um, today, but also wanna um, give you a brief overview how this, this whole case developed. So in 2015, uh, back when, when my, my boss and I were still working in Bochum, um, a six-year-old boy with a terminal junctional epidermal lysis bullosa was admitted to our burn unit. Um, the burn unit consists of the children's hospital where the intensive care um, is taking place and then the plastic surgery unit in a different hospital where the operations take place. Um, well, this young kid was admitted and he had lost already over 60% total body surface area um, of epidermis due to an acute exacerbation of his condition. Um, uh, just quickly about junctional epidermolysis bullosa, you probably know better than I do um, uh, that this is a um, um, often lethal genetic um, skin disease. Um, based uh, in this case on uh, LAMP3, um, which is encoding for laminin 5, which um, is sort of a, a connector of the dermis to the epidermis. So if that is missing, that causes blisters and erosions, massive chronic wounds. Um, so far, there's no clinical cure. Um, so the patients, if they have these massive exacerbations, usually die. Uh, and often before adolescence, only symptomatic treatments are currently clinically available. So in this case, um, this went uh, south uh, very fast um, as we were as we were taking care of these massive wounds in the burn unit. Um, um, the boy lost even more skin, so eighty percent uh, total body surface area was septic, serious uh, organ failure, very poor short-term prognosis. So we started palliative care as expected and talked to the family um, that we are at this point now. Um, however, we also started a search for experimental treatments, anything that could maybe help us um, treat this boy better. And we ran into a paper published in 2010 by Professor Michele Di Luca from uh, Modena, Italy. And he had published that in, in patients with a jab, he had um, taken skin samples and had grown epidermal um, stem cells in the lab and transfected them with an intact uh, gene for, for that um, laminin protein. And uh, on small areas that had actually worked and the skin was stable. So we rang him up and asked him if, if our patient um, could somehow be treated with this and uh, this technology that was developed for JEP um, uh, was basically fitting to this patient. So um, after a lot of discussion, um, um, we decided to go forward and try this 
experimental compassionate care approach for the patient, despite the high perioperative risk. So we took a sample, sent it to Modena. Professor De Luca processed that sample and grew um, around one square meter of um, epidermal sheets. Um, from this, we transplanted them. And this is the short-term result, basically, after this experimental treatment. And um, after the boy was dying and after the treatment, he could be discharged from the ICU several months later and uh, was then going actually back to school. Um, so that was, <clears throat> that was a big success for us. The result was better than we had expected. And we could show that the skin was intact, that the epidermis was intact and showed a normal structure despite lack of uh, really ridges um, in histology. And we could also show that the laminin uh, was present and which was lacking before. However, we were concerned or wondering about the long-term outcome um, towards um, um, malignancies that could potentially uh, happen due to this treatment uh, about the skin stability. So then we did a very uh, thorough um, follow-up um, for five years, and this is what we published now. Um, the clinical outcome was really 100% stable in all the transplanted areas, and we could show um, that there was still blistering, however, only in the, in the areas that actually were not transplanted, as you can see on the uh, um, bottom right, the thorax and abdomen, the, everywhere where you see the blisters, um, that is basically non-transplanted, and around the blisters is the transplanted skin. The back is 100% transplanted and has never shown any sort of blister again. So we are very pleased with this result. Um, what we could also show is that there were no signs uh, for malignancies. Um, we could show that there were no contractures that, that at any site that had been transplanted, any joint site that had been transplanted. And what was also very, very interesting was that uh, the boy didn't need any external ointments as we usually see in, for example, burn patients that we treat with a spit split thickness skin grafting, um, they regularly need uh, daily ointments. So that was very, a very pleasing result. Um, and we saw the recurrent blistering in the non-transplanted areas. So going to the histology, um, what we could see is despite the, the, the regular architecture of, of the epidermis, despite the, the, the really ridges, um, we could also show, especially if you, if you uh, look at the bottom left, we could show that um, Langerhans cells had um, um, migrated back into the epidermis um, that couldn't be seen one or two years um, after the transplantation. However, at five years, that's what you can see here in, in image G. There were mel um, melanocytes, there were Merkel cells. Overall, uh, we are very happy um, with these results. Um, what we could also show was that um, the, the uh, transfection um, was uh, still successful. Uh, the integration was still there. Um, we could show that the protein expression was uh, still uh, present five years after the transplantation. And what was very important to us was that we were able to demonstrate that um, there was no challenge of the um, transfected stem cells by stem cells from the hair follicle. Um, so we could basically demonstrate at the interface between hair follicle and, and regular epi epidermis, uh, um, there was sort of a border. Um, so there was no migration back into the follicles, but there was also uh, no migration as one might expect from the hair follicle into the epidermis challenging the uh, transfected stem cells. And we also did some testing towards skin physiology um, and we could show uh, co also comparing to a healthy population that transepidermal water loss was uh, normal and that skin hydration 
it was sort of on the dry side, however, uh, uh, not dramatic and clinically it was fine. Skin pigmentation and skin erythema um, also um, nothing dramatic there. Um, we performed some quantitative sensory testing. Um, um, despite a good clinical outcome, the patient did not complain about any, any sort of, of problems uh, towards sensory function. However, we quantified it and it looks like there was some sort of critical illness um, neuropathy um, in the beginning um, um, following, uh, following our care. However, that uh, quantitative sensory testing mostly recovered and uh, the patient never uh, had any pro problems clinically. Um, to discuss our results, um, we could demonstrate an excellent long-term result uh, with this treatment with a fully stable epidermis. Um, we could not show any signs of malignancies due to the treatment. Um, we could demonstrate that there was no challenge of the transgenic stem cells. Um, we could show that there's a reconstitution of the skin's immune system. We could demonstrate that there's a free passage of of skin appendages through that epidermis, which um, is important for the functional outcome. Um, we could demonstrate an intact barrier function um, of, of that um, skin. Um, and we could also uh, show a normal epidermal architecture. Um, these findings uh, lead us to believe that it may make sense to start this sort of treatment once it's clinically um, approved earlier before we have such a massive exacerbation we can maybe prevent um, a, a dermal scarification that we also um, um, could see uh, to achieve even better functional outcomes um, yes and what's next after this five-year follow-up there will be further clinical studies also for other subtypes of epidermolysis bullosa. And um, our collaborator, uh, Michele De Luca in, in Modena is really pushing this forward um, to make this available, um, in this treatment as soon as possible to other uh, little patients. Um, optimization of the treatment algorithm in terms of earlier application uh, in, the, in the disease process um, is an important factor. Um, maybe an application in burn treatment um, might make sense in the future um, since the, the outcomes were overwhelmingly uh, good um, um, in the transplanted areas. This is something we are uh, discussing at the moment. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Um... We've got time for a few short questions. Uh, can I ask you, uh, Max Million, um, how costly is this treatment? And and do you think it's it's uh, you know on a case by case basis? Well, I I mean this treat this treatment of the one patient was uh, extremely costly. Uh, I can tell you that much. Um, um, however, once this becomes more established um, of course this cost is going to go down um, um, it will never be a cheap treatment however if you look at the overall treatment cost of an epidermolysis pullosa patient like this with all the dressing changes and everything um, it might even turn out cheaper in the end um, if you can address uh, this early in in the disease process and you you um, can prevent all these dressing changes. Uh, Matthias Schmuth asks, how would this uh, be different from prior attempts of skin transplantation of burn wounds? Uh, can you repeat the question? I didn't get the first. So how, how would this be different from previous attempts of skin oh, transplantation of burn wounds? Okay. Well, we've been doing uh, keratinocyte transplantation for a long time now for burns, if we have massive, massive burns. However, the, the results um, are somewhat 
not that great to the extent that we would be satisfied and we we were wondering why that is and in in our nature paper the first one that we published in 2017 we could actually demonstrate for the first time in humans that the epidermis is sustained by very few very potent um, um, epidermal stem cells that are called holoclones and we believe that the way the way our our process in our uh, professor de luca's process in moderna works how he's treating these cells after after the biopsy um, leads to survival of these stem cells for the transplant and we believe that in this during this process, there's a difference uh, that makes the holoclone survive in our technology, and therefore um, the quality of skin is better than in the regular keratinocyte transplantation. Uh, there's two, two questions. Fo follow up questions, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, before we maybe switch also one or two questions to, to Johannes. Uh, Johannes actually is asking you uh, if the age of the patient plays a role, and maybe just to follow up on that one, if the sweat gland growth actually. What about that after the transplantation? Okay. Can you check for that. Um, yeah. Uh, um, first question. Uh, it's probably that we could show that there um, were enough holoclones in this patient to actually make this successful. Um, and it is known that there are more of these highly potent stem cells uh, in earlier ages than in older ages. So, so that would also speak for doing this um, as early as possible. And it would be smarter to do a 10%, 20% treatment each time than having to do a huge uh, transplantation um, to make this process easier for the patient. Um, and um, the second question, I think it's important that we do not seal the skin as we do with, for example, split thickness skin graft. So the, the, the skin appendages have no chance on sort of getting, growing back to the surface. And this is, I guess, um, this is the crucial thing what makes, makes the, the, the skin clinically better now than as you usually have it with a split thickness skin graft, for example. Excellent, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I have a question to you, Jonas. Uh, I mean, you showed that th th there's a control and this, this drives to TH2. Do you have any idea if, if this can be potentiated by, by in atopic patients and therefore they're more prone to, to uh, sensitizations and allergies? Yeah, that's something that we want to now study. Um, also, which is uh, hopefully something we can start up soon here in Marburg. And because that's exactly the question, is this sort of leading to a vicious cycle in, in allergy or type 2 immune responses where you have um, these dendritic cells driving by default already a Th2 response, but then having more and more of these cytokines potentiating the dendritic cell and leading to even more type 2 immunity. And also, of course, the other question, other way around in dupilumab treatment, which blocks the R4 receptor, does this actually, is it a double bullet sort of, is it catching or, or, or limiting the differentiation of the T cells, but also limiting the differentiation of these type two promoting dendritic cells, which also potentially might be regulated in humans in the similar way through R4 or R13 signal. Do you think that follow up on that, uh, because in, in DUPI, we, we see some patients develop psoriasis or PSA that this could contribute. I mean, uh, uh, Emanuel yes, Ganova and, and, and that would, showed that as well, but uh, could that yeah. be your contribution? So well? that, would, that would correlate a little bit with our observation, which um, identified that this population of dendritic cells uh, regulates the Th2, Th17 axis, not so much the Th1 axis. And so that might also uh, be a hint or something worth considering that maybe then um, with the lack of Th2, it is not so much the Th1 response that affected and, and was uh, more classically thought to be the yin yang, but it now more and more evidence suggests that it's actually the Th2, Th17 balance. Mm -hmm. And that even on the level of dendritic cells that might be regulated. 
Great. There's no further question for the time being. I mean, uh, there still can be uh, questions afterwards. And the, the, as uh, mentioned before, the talks will be online tomorrow or on Friday on, on YouTube as is the usual channels. And I think the next uh, ESDR Kitchen will be in three weeks uh, with Ilis Brecher and myself again sharing the session. So uh, we'll keep it short. Thank you too for these excellent uh, presentations. Uh, great work. Uh, we'll, oh, wait, there's maybe another question coming in. Um, oh, no, it's just a thank you again. So um, uh, looking forward to see you soon for the next session. Thanks you two again for these presentations. Thanks, Adele, for sharing again with me. And uh, see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you.